And so it was this huge joke and we were all criticizing it. And as soon as I saw La Sombrita, I'm not a big Halloween person, but I said, this is my Halloween costume this year. Ever heard the phrase, numbers don't lie? Unfortunately, that's not true. It's really easy to lie with numbers, even if the numbers you're using are real. Hey everyone, welcome to the Active Town channel. My name is John Zimmerman and that is Kelsey Hughes and Jenna Haynes from Austin, Texas. And we're gonna be talking about leveraging social media content creation, uh, specifically TikTok, uh, to be able to move the needle in our communities and getting people educated, enhancing awareness, and more importantly, getting people engaged. Let's get right to it with Jenna and Kelsey. Kelsey and Jenna, welcome to the Active Towns podcast. Thanks for having us. Thanks, John. <laughs> well, hey, you two. I love having my guests just uh, give a really quick introduction. So I'm going to turn the floor over to the two of you. Uh, let's start off with you, Kelsey. Uh, who is Kelsey? My name is Kelsey Hughes. I live in Austin, Texas. I love riding my bike. I just got an e-bike and I love connecting through social media particularly on Twitter. And more recently this year, I've been really into TikTok. I'm also a board member of Rethink 35, which is an organization fighting I-35 expansion in Austin and pushing for a better plan. Great. Jenna. Hi, my name is Jenna Haynes. I am a policy advisor uh, for a city council member at the city of Austin, but I am only speaking for myself in this conversation. And honestly, I think what's more important about what we're talking about is the work that I've done um, as an activist and uh, on social media and in person as an organizer. I think that is some of the most important and exciting work that I've done. And so uh, I'm really excited to talk about it with you today. Yeah. Uh, Jenna, we'll, we'll stick with you for just a second. What was sort of your background coming into this and getting to into politics? Well, it was sort of a left turn for me. I was always interested in politics as, I guess, kind of a hobby, but I got a degree in video production. And so that was sort of the natural transition to TikTok for me was that it was the skill that I had to provide to some of the organizations that I was working with. Um, at the time, it was a climate organization. So I worked with the Sunrise Movement and also the Citizens Climate Lobby. And from there, I got more and more invested into organizing and eventually my career switched over. So now I am doing mainstream politics, not, not as much of the protest organizing, but I do have that background, which I think is really helpful. So Wow. Wow. Now, are you originally from Austin? I'm not. I'm from Atlanta, Georgia, and um, well, a small town outside of Atlanta. And one of the things that I loved the most about that town was how walkable it was, how I could, I, I never took a bus to school because it just wasn't necessary. And we would, you know, walk to restaurants for dinner and that kind of thing. And when I moved to Austin and losing that, that was a big transition and one that I was not used to relying on cars to get around. And so that kind of informs a lot of my politics surrounding um, urbanism. Wow. Interesting. Well, I'm sure we'll come back to a little bit of that <laughs> in terms of I'm uh, sure. you know, that, that car, sh car culture shock that, that, that you have there. How about you, Kelsey? I mean, where were you from originally? I grew up in Enid, Oklahoma, which is a town of about 40,000 people. So similar to Jenna, I grew up riding my bike, walking around the neighborhood with my friends. But to me, the car was always a source of freedom because I could finally get out of the small town. Mm -hmm. So I have turned 360 and now I believe that not having a car is freedom. Right. <laughs> what do you think caused that 360 turn for you? I know the 360 turn happened because I lived in Philadelphia for three years. Okay. And I could walk to my friend's apartments. I was introduced to biking in a city environment. Okay. Um, I was just in a totally different world and it opened my eyes to what was possible. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Well, Jenna, um, I like to tease uh, folks and say, yeah, I'm a, a, 
a professional health promotion professional, public health professional with, uh, with now uh, a YouTube channel. So <laughs> after 30 some odd years in, in public health, I, I find myself uh, doing storytelling and, and interviewing people from around the globe and, uh, and producing videos every day, day in and day out. So props to you for, for somebody who actually has a degree in doing this. I had to teach myself very, very quickly. Well, you're <laughs> so. very good at it. So, well, thank you. Um, so actually video is part of the reason why I wanted you both on the channel because you are doing something very, very cool in, 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 in both in your own little niches in the, your, in, in what I, what I'm pointing to, or you're trying to get to is this TikTok thing. And the fact that you are, you know, producing this content and it's resonating with people. And Kelsey, I think this is how we actually finally got connected. Yes. Isn't that correct? I didn't know about you until the Barton yeah. Skyway TikTok. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, in fact, let's let's pull the Barton Skyway TikTok up here and we'll play this and and in the beginning here, folks, Kelsey actually says Barton uh, Springs Road. She means Barton Skyway <laughs> in this. But but yeah, let's let's play this real quick. And, and that'll be that'll sort of a, a reminder of uh, how we got connected. So the city of Austin recently put in these flexible bollards on Barton Springs Road. And as someone who lives in this neighborhood, I thought it was amazing because I can bike safer. I can feel more safer as a pedestrian. There's fewer lanes of cars. And the cars are also driving a lot slower on this road. But then I found out the neighborhood people who drive cars started a petition to remove them and have 619 signatures. And as a pedestrian, I want these. And so I started my own petition. So please go sign mine and let's get more than theirs. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I was like, who the heck is this? I mean, <laughs> but I can't remember how we, we, we got connected. I mean, I know I produced a video on Barton Skyway as well. Can you recall? I, I can't re recall how how that kind of all played out. I mean, it was all playing out on Twitter because I'm not hanging yeah. out on tw and on TikTok. You you, you repost yeah. your your your, uh, your your TikToks on Twitter, so or X I or whatever we call it. But, yeah. <laughs> I repost the ones that I want to push out more broadly on Twitter. So right. that was definitely one because a lot of people from Twitter signed my petition. Right. And I think that you DM'd me on Twitter. We should okay. verify that, but I think okay. that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it may have been that because I I, I was in the process of uh, producing a couple of different videos. And I think I I think it was about the timing of when Sam Balto from uh, yeah. from Portland was in town. And so I was taking him around and we, we shot a little bit of video uh, out there on Barton Skyway, uh, Barton Hills Drive, past the Barton Hills Elementary, Elementary, so he could see the protected bikeways there for the school because he's like, oh my gosh, I'd love to have a protected bikeway, you know, to my elementary school. He's a, a, a elementary uh, school teacher, uh, physical education teacher, and, and does the bike bus there at Alameda Elementary. So I think that's how that all uh, came together. And yes. And it's not that TikTok was new to me. I had already interviewed other TikTok influencers from around the the, the country, uh, you know, because it's really something that's taking off is mm -hmm. urbanism on TikTok. And it's for for me, it, you know, being an old gray hair, it's it's like really, really cool to see that these these things that, you know, we've been in the trenches working on for many, many decades are being passed off to a new generation and using leaning into a newer platform and, and video platform. Jenna, talk a little bit about that because you know you have that formal education in video production. You spent mm -hmm. time in some some rather formal video production houses and producing you know sort of like that YouTube channel sort of stuff like what I do. What was that like? You know, discovering TikTok you know, back in twenty twenty one. It was quite a transition between the two styles because initially TikTok did not even have a robust editing platform at all. You know, now there's an entire screen that you can go into where you can cut clips and rearrange them. When I first started making TikToks, you couldn't cut 
TikToks except at the very beginning and the very end. That's the only places you could trim it. You couldn't rearrange clips. If you wanted to rearrange things, you would have to go back and actually click like redo and you would have to refilm it and hope that it made sense. Um, and that was definitely a big transition from working with, you know, I was a Premiere Pro user and that is certainly more robust than TikTok is even now. But that initial transition of basically that old style, like record with a camcorder and export directly to a VCR, um, which is how people used to make home videos and stuff like that, uh, was definitely tough. But I saw, I think, the potential in TikTok. I had been talking to folks about making my own YouTube channel or something along those lines because I wanted to get some of these political ideas that I had out in front of people. And it was, you know, pointed out to me that there's a platform that's massively growing during the pandemic and with people who have what I think they had six times their users in the first month of the of the lockdown, just because people heard about it, it was the new thing. And the most important piece is that it wasn't oversaturated already because people were intimidated by it. People are intimidated by the concept of filming. It's different from, you know, I don't know if I can curse, but uh, Go for it. Shit, post, shit posting on Twitter is takes a lot less effort, you know? Yeah. So um, when seeing that take off and knowing that I already had the skills of just structuring a video um, alone was, it seemed like kind of a natural transition and it paid off pretty well. So um, I am really glad that I, I decided to do that, but I'll, at the beginning, I'll tell you, it was definitely a struggle. I, we have to play, um, the, Jenna, this is one of my favorite ones from, from, oh, uh, man. from, your, uh, from, <laughs> oh, your, from your thing. It's, yes. it's this, oh. it's this one. <laughs> my most recent yeah, this is this is freaking amazing. And uh, I was I was uh, out at the uh, the big rally uh, filming it so that Adam uh, could start releasing, you know, some of the videos from the big rally there. Right. And so I had my big cameras running and, and I was walking around with my GoPro and and getting some, you know, c crowd reactions and all that sort of stuff. And then I turned all that stuff over to Adam because I'm too busy to edit it right now. And he loves editing it because he has a background in video editing. And so. Mm -hmm. He's he's making his way through it. But yeah, let's let's play this. Welcome to your new normal. That's right. Austin residents are going to see a huge expansion in the highway that runs through the center of the city. This huge expansion is going to have a really negative effect on the environment of the city of Austin and the people who live here. It's going to worsen light pollution, sound pollution, air pollution, even particulate matter from car tires. So what can we do about it? We can attend the Wider Won't Work rally against expanding I-35 this Sunday at 11 a.m. in Austin. Greg Kassar will be there, I'll be there, and I hope you'll be there too. Because this is not what Austin's future should look like. I love it. That is so good. Oh no, not uh, again. <laughs> <laughs> Kelsey, I don't know if you have this problem, but watching yeah. myself, I'm always like, ah, oh. uh, <laughs> it's no. a little weird. It's a bit weird. Yeah. Well, t so, t so talk a little bit about that. I mean, that's one of the, one of the things that a lot of people have trouble with in trying to produce uh, content to try to move the needle, to try to influence others and try to tell the narratives and tell the stories. And I like to tell, tell folks that, yeah, eventually you get, you get over it. <laughs> you know? yeah, exactly. Um, I think that it's one of those things that you only get through it by getting through it. Yeah. Um, it reminds me of canvassing. Um, I used to be a canvasser. In fact, I used to film videos in between houses. I would film clips for my TikToks. And that being a canvasser uh, for No Way Prop A, which was this, we were campaigning against this thing that would have allocated a huge portion of the money in the city permanently to the police. And so I'm sorry, I don't know if you can hear my cat hissing at me, but okay. Um, she was trying to <laughs> it's, it's, um, it's all good. They hate the, the, me. It's this, fine. Is a, this is a cat friendly environment. <laughs> well, that's that's good because there's a lot of cats in the videos, I got to say. Um, yeah, no, it was one thing that you get used to for canvassing, especially something as controversial as police 
issue canvassing, you get used to rejection and you start, you, you get through it and it stops bothering you. And that was really huge for me, taught me how to network. It's been really useful. And I feel like TikTok works the exact same way. I, you, you film it, you feel embarrassed, you post it. Sometimes you get hate. Sometimes you get, you know, no likes and you delete it because you're like, oh my gosh, how could I have thought that that would succeed? But eventually it stops bothering you really at all, um, which is good when you're making political content um, because you definitely get the, the crazies. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. I try to embrace the imperfect. So even in my Bart Skyway video, I know that I did that incorrectly, but I just let it be out there because it's, it's a lot of effort to redo stuff. And if you look at my page, I'll film a lot of stuff of me sitting in my bed with no makeup on, with a terrible phone angle. And it's kind of me telling myself, I don't need to be perfect. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter. Um, and I, so I think it's a good practice in general for me. Yeah. Cause they'll find something. You could, yeah, you could be a supermodel with professional lighting with, you know, perfect hair and you could be an AI and they would still yeah. find something to call fat or ugly. And it doesn't matter, right? Like that is, that is where you have to be just really resilient and really um, able to turn off the phone if it bothers you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm, I'm debating which, which of your videos I should go to. You mentioned the prop a one, but you also mentioned the kittens. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I actually think um, one of the videos that I put in there was one of my earlier videos. I've since taken it down. Okay. It was the first video I ever had that kind of popped off. Like it, I think it got like 600,000 views and I was completely blown away. Mm -hmm. And it, it sort of really informed the way that I make videos after that. So if... Interesting. Which one I is that? One. It is the Texas Grid one. Oh yeah. Boom. Let's let's go to the Texas Grid. I hope environmentalists are happy because the Texas Grid is about to fail again in the summer, just like it failed in the winter. This is because Texas power relies entirely on wind and solar. And as you can tell right now, it is not windy, nor is it sunny. This just goes to show that power supply is a systemic problem that what? You mean the conditions right now are perfect for wind and solar and it's coal and natural gas that's failing us? Um, I didn't hear any of that. This is an individual problem. Conserve your power or you're selfish. <laughs> <laughs> so, but, but what's really, really cool about that is, is the fact that there's comedy in there, there's snark in there, and that seems to be like one of the magic sort of bullets that you can use. Yeah, making people laugh. Um, but I'll tell you that that informed that my structure for a long time after that, because the reason it went crazy is because it got a bunch of comments right at the beginning um, mm. saying, oh, my gosh, I thought I was on the wrong side of TikTok. Oh, my gosh, I thought that you were a Republican. I typed out a whole paragraph and I deleted it. And that is I mean, I knew this intellectually, but it hadn't really clicked how much if you give people something to grab onto in your video, they will talk about it. They'll keep watching to see where it goes. That's why I think embracing the imperfect, like Kelsey was saying, is is such a great way to talk about it, because truly, if your videos are perfect, that means they're not going to get any kind of response because there's nothing to add. So I'll I'll misspell something. I'll use the wrong photo or um, for a long time I did videos where I would start it and the first sentence or two sounds like you're on um, a Republican TikTok and then it kind of takes a left turn and I figured out that just if you give people a reason to to kind of knock out of their scrolling haze and be like wait what's going on that really will will boost your success and get your message out to more people so well, it's, I in, need to try this. <laughs> yeah, I mean, part of it's a hook, right? Mm -hmm. Are you, are you yeah. noticing that too, Kelsey, is, is like something that is like, you know, is almost like a, a hook, a com maybe it's a little comedy routine. You did a whole comedy routine on the, on the silly shade structures, some burritos or whatever they were. Do you see her oh. um, Halloween costume? My Halloween oh my costume. gosh. Yeah. <laughs> Lost some burrito. So, so give the background on it. Oh, 
Oh, La Sombrita. I think La Sombrita was announced when, like, May or June. Yeah. So anyone who takes the bus, especially in a hot place like Austin, knows how miserable it can be waiting for the bus in the heat. And so earlier this year, the L.A. Department of Transportation announced their new infrastructure for bus stops, and it was La Sombrita, and it was supposed to provide shade and lighting especially for women but it's the shade structure made out of a mesh material and in all of the photos that they used to announce it the people standing under it were not shaded (laughs) and so it was this huge joke and we were all criticizing it and as soon as i saw la sombrita I'm not a big Halloween person, but I said, this is my Halloween costume this year. And I made it happen. Yeah. Um, yeah. It was yeah. really good. And so the video that we have here is a perfect transition to that because uh, I, I'm, I, I don't know, Kelsey, I, I'm, I'm kind of with uh, L.A. on this. I'm thinking La Sabrito probably would be great in this environment. Let's let's turn this up and, <laughs> and find out, you know, I don't know. Okay, I, yeah, let's check it yeah. out. Let's check it out. And it's 101 degrees outside. I wanted to show how much shade there is. This is 5 p.m. So there's this awning. Um, This is where you could stand against. It's really, really hot. Here's some benches under a tree. As you can see, there's not really shade here because the sun's right there. Um, There's some shade on these steps but they're very low to the ground, so people with mobility issues might have trouble with that. And then there's a bench over here, completely unshaded. I don't see how this encourages people to take public transportation. Yeah. So it's miserable out there Yeah. in the summertime. It is yeah. awful. Yeah, and you're and you're of course in my neck of the woods, uh, my neighborhood yeah. there, uh, you know, on South Lamar at the Broken Spoke, and you know, and of course that's one of our most notorious roads in mm-hmm. our uh, in our city. And yeah, it, it, I mean, you have to treat people with dignity. You can't expect that, you know. But I don't know, man. You know, the, maybe a little bit bigger loss and breeds. <laughs> 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 um, I'd be curious what the city of Austin could come up with. But I think um, this type of video is what really inspires me to create TikToks. Okay. It's just my frustration in my day-to-day life a lot of the times. And so, as you can see in that video, I'm really hot. My face is red. I'm frustrated. I'm waiting for the bus. And I just feel like I want someone to pay attention to this. Yeah. And so I make a video about it. And I can't, and then I think maybe my city council person will see this. Maybe someone who shows up at city council will see this. Maybe Cap Metro will see this. Yeah. But maybe in general, I just want it. someone to see. What we, <laughs> John will see it. Yes. Yeah. 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 So, Jenna, when you look back at, the, at these last, you know, two or three years of producing content and getting it out on TikTok and, uh, and, and bringing attention to some of these very important issues, what's been the uptake like, you know, been like, and, and is it, is it just, is it just city of Austin people that are tuning in or are you getting a global audience? Um, I'd say more recently, I've been covering city of Austin specific topics. And so um, the TikTok algorithm, which I am an evangelist for that algorithm, I think it's magic. Um, It is the best social media content algorithm on the planet. And uh, I think uh, uh, maybe against the grain here, but I think that that's a good thing (laughs) specifically because, and this is why I'm an evangelist about it. If you make content on TikTok, that's worth watching for anyone right it will find the person that it's worth watching for and show it to that person so that's why like when i transitioned from making more national content or kind of texas content to making austin specific covering austin politics it was a very smooth transition from showing it to everyone to showing it to people who knew what i was talking about that you know certainly shrank my audience but at I don't need someone in Maine. I'm sorry, their cats are still attacking my setup. Um, I don't need someone in Maine or in Washington to see my Austin 
content. And so like a smaller viewership is natural and I was fine with it. So I'd say when I realized that having a smaller audience meant that I was communicating with the exact people I wanted to reach, um, as opposed to casting a really wide net, getting a lot of viewers, but most of them were people that had nothing to do with the topic I was covering, like the Texas grid. Um, I've been a lot happier with the um, setup that I have now. And that has been um, a really interesting transition because of initially, I'll tell you, seeing numbers go up on the on the follower list and on the likes counter and stuff. I mean, that's incredibly um, rewarding. Eh? But like that is not what my goal was. And so dialing into, a, like I said, a smaller audience that is more focused on the issues I actually care about um, has been really, really rewarding in a more real way. Yeah. And Kelsey, your approach has been a little bit more as you mentioned earlier, being out there and and basically experiencing life and and expressing your frustrations and putting it out there. And this is a two a two video series that's a little bit of a success story. So let's let's play this and and uh, and we'll talk a little bit about this and and how surprised or not surprised you were at the success. Welcome to my new series, Austin three one one where I log requests to the city of Austin asking for them to update pedestrian and bicycling infrastructure, and they respond. We're at the Ann Richards School for Girls. This is a new middle school and high school building in South Austin next to an In-N-Out, which is very popular. And over here, you can't see, but there's a bus stop over there. And the school put in these new nice ramps out into the street. However, as you can see, this one does not have a crosswalk and there is no ramp on the other side. So I loved a request explaining that and I said, I just walked across and a car did not slow down for me. This is near school and must be fixed. They responded to me. At this time, there is not a mechanism to build a new ramp right away on the other side due to that driveway unless there is a new build there. So essentially... Not our problem. You can deal with it and get hit by cars. Thanks. Get over it. Come on. But, but. In July, I went for a walk and oh my gosh, there was a ramp. How did this happen? So I emailed the engineer back. I said, I'm so happy about this ramp. I just saw it. I made a video about it. Here it is. How did this happen? He said, we got safe routes to school to help pay and build it. Crosswalk coming soon, yay. A month later, the crosswalk was painted, the pylons were put in, the signs tell the cars to slow down. This is a huge improvement. And I've seen the girls at Ann Richards School across the street using it, and I'm so happy that it's a lot safer now. 3 one one win. Hey, you gotta oh take those gosh. wins when you can get them, right? I know. That is awesome. Yeah. Thank you. And, and Jenna, this this kind of touches into your day to day life because you are, you know, an employee, you know, working mm -hmm. for one of the city council members. Yeah. And we are, you know, very proud of 311. It's a bunch of very hardworking people that do their best to connect um, folks within the city to the folks within the city to, you know, constituents and residents that need their assistance. And um, I'm glad to see that they made that connection so well, even in the first video. And um, I think that what I love about the transportation and public works employees at the city is how creative they are. And so when there wasn't funding within the city's current structure, they, they found an alternative solution. And um, that I think is really indicative of where Austin is at, which is that there's a lot of change needed, but there's a lot of will to make that change. And that is just such a great place to be at. And it's a great time to be working for the city. Yeah. And, and just for, you know, the viewers and listeners, uh, you know, that are, you know, <laughs> tuning into this and going, ah, you know, why aren't there, isn't there money for this? I think it was estimated that the, the sidewalk backlog, and this is just of unbuilt sidewalks is well over a billion dollars in the city of Austin. And so it, it, there's, you know, part of the challenge with a city like Austin that grew so incredibly quickly, like an amoeba, horizontal expansion, uh, very car centric, 
a lot of these very, very simple, very, very fundamental safety facilities just were overlooked. Yeah. And um, the tax base in Austin, too, there's a real challenge for any Texas city because Texas has banned income tax. And so with the limitation to exclusively property and sales tax for localities and additionally a 3% cap on uh, revenue increases every year, there is almost no way to, um, you know, if we need more sidewalks, more ramps, more crosswalks, the only place to take that money is away from another department. And, you know, we we challenge people every year to balance the budget. I think it's a great practice. And it, it also gives us a lot of information about what people want the budget to look like. But at the same time, it's it really is great evidence of how much if we need good things to happen in one area, we have to have fewer good things in another. And that, do you sacrifice parks? Do you sacrifice fire, like firefighters? Like there's, there's real, real challenges when it comes to balancing those things. And I'd say the city is working as fast as it can to, to update the infrastructure. Yeah. And, and to, to kind of address one of the, the key challenges that is out there is the difference between capital dollars and operational dollars. And uh, much, uh, in fact, every single time, uh, you know, a major bond has been put forth uh, over the last few years that, you know, is tied to enhancements uh, for safety, uh, enhancements for walking and biking facilities. Uh, You know, those bonds have passed, you know, with flying colors. Yeah. Uh, You know, it was a, a couple years ago, I think it was the 2020 election, uh, you know, Prop B was a, a massive investment. And, you know, that was on the heels of a 2018 bond and a, a 2016 bond. So, you know, three bond elections in a row of massive amounts of funding going towards uh, enhancements of bikeways and sidewalks and pedestrian crossings. Uh, these are all the things that need to take place. Those are capital dollars, though, that, you know, that those that bond that bonding is 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 funding. You still have to figure out to your point uh, there, Jenna, you still have to figure out a limited amount of budget coming in on operational dollars. In other words, there has to be some funding for staff to be able to ramp up, to be able to accelerate, you know, the build out of, of these types of things. And throwing around dollars, you know, you you look at um, the bonding funding that the city has raised, the voters have actually approved, dating back to, I believe it was 1982, it's like $1.6 or $1.7 billion worth of funding associated with active transportation and trails and bikeways and things of this nature. And I got these numbers from my interview with Ted Siff. Uh, with the Austin outside, who has been one of the you know advocates, community advocates that have been putting a lot of these bonds forward, helping uh, you know move these things forward. Uh, but we're we're throwing big numbers around. Uh, but if we're going to throw big numbers around, we're going to have to throw you know this kind of big number around. <laughs> oh gosh! <laughs> so the State Department of uh, Transportation TxDOT is you know saying that they are going to jam a an expansion of I-35, uh, you know, down the throats of, of Austin once again. Um, the fact that I-35 was built in the first place was a bit of uh, a controversy that, you know, shouldn't go unnoticed. But, you know, right now they're saying, what is it, $4.5 billion? I think that's a gross underestimation. I'd say this is definitely a $10 billion, if not more, uh, project here. Um, and it's problematic. Kelsey, you're on the board of this institution, this organization, Rethink 35. Talk a little bit about what we're trying to do from, you know, from a movement standpoint to let people know about what this expansion really is. Um, from a movement perspective, we just held a rally which was, I think, a huge mm-hmm. success. So, which is that video kind of, that we of Jenna's that we watched? Yes. So Jenna made a promotional video for us, and we had hundreds of people come out. And it's really amazing to me how many people still have hope that we can stop this thing. And I have the most hope that we can, or else I wouldn't be doing this. But we have people at all levels of government who are with us. 
we had um, Greg Kassar come out, who was a U.S. congressman. We had two of our state representatives send their support. We had so many city council people speak at the rally, community advocates. Um, and so we're in this current timeline where TxDOT has published their final plan. They plan to start construction early next year, and we're trying to stop it. So the current plan is through a lawsuit and more details to come on that. But in general, we need people to be making noise. Yeah. And you, you just mentioned um, our representative, uh, Greg Kassar, former uh, city council member as well. Uh, let's let's hear from him because this is him at the, at the rally. And I walked into this rally just with this incredible new surge of hope and of energy because I thought back to over eight years ago when I became an Austin City Council member. And there wasn't a majority of us standing up against uh, I-35 expansion. There wasn't a rally of hundreds of people ready to stand up against TxDOT. This movement has grown so much. It's brought so many people together. And I know that together we can win. What do you guys think? Yeah, I mean, what an inspirational day that was. Um, Congratulations, Kelsey. I know that you put a lot of work. I know the entire team put a lot of work in, in doing that. So yeah. incredible. Just so well done. Thank you. Yeah. And Greg is a great speaker. Oh, Greg is awesome. <laughs> um, I do want to bring this back to TikTok because part of our strategy for the rally and for other things is that as a team, we'll put together what's called a social media toolkit. And so we have a Google Drive, we'll throw in images. Um, so images of the expansion, AI generated things, memes, um, and then we'll put a document together of talking points and we'll send this toolkit to different activists or influencers on TikTok. So I think Jenna was one of the people I sent yep. that to this time because I knew she could make an amazing video. So all those photos, all those images were from that toolkit. But yeah, the big one with all the um, roads like looping around. So each other, funny. Yes. That one was from the toolkit. So it's this new strategy that campaigns are using to create a toolkit, send it to a lot of people who want to spread the message. Um, and I think a recent one I made a TikTok about because they sent me a toolkit was the Sierra Club. They sent some information about the Texas state props that we voted on in this last election. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So let, let's lean into that a little bit um, with the two of you, uh, you know, now with a little bit of experience in TikTok, a little little bit of experience producing the sort of content to try to move the needle in and grow support for initiatives. Uh, any sage advice <laughs> and, and for, for people uh, around the country, around the world who are watching this or listening to this and would like to try to grow their movement. Uh, any additional points other than the toolkit? I think the, the best, the thing that Rethink is so good at and the thing that makes them so um, successful online is the varying jumping in points that they provide. Like it's such a deep rabbit hole, right? Like understanding why this is happening, how it can be stopped, that kind of thing. It, there's so many complex answers. You could talk for hours about it, and I'm sure we could right now. Um, but they provide sets of information that are for the person that has no idea what's going on and wants the most basic intro to, you know, someone who has maybe done, tried to stop a highway in another city and wants to see how it applies to Austin. You know, their website has all this information. They provide content that targets people with different levels of knowledge and different experiences with activism. And they also provide ways to get involved that are anything from signing a petition to making calls to um, actually showing up in person, to actually being an organizer. Those are all things that you can access. And so it allows people to find exactly what they're looking for the first time they look, which means you're not trying to get people's attention over and over and over. Because the first time people you get someone's attention, that's the time they're the most likely to act, in my opinion. I would say if I'm 
thinking about advice for people who want to do similar to Rethink 35, we have really found another organization doing work that we really respect and we formed a relationship with them and gotten a lot of advice from them. That organization is StopTex.I45 in Houston. So I have just received so much wisdom from the people in that group about how to handle volunteers, how to do canvassing, just everything. And so I think just reach out to someone you admire and try to form that relationship. Yeah. Very good. Very good. Any additional ones, uh, Jenna, advice? I mean, we can get into TikTok editing specifics if you want to. (laughs) I'm going to learn this, actually. (laughs) (laughs) I think if you want to pull up one of the kitten videos, that's a great example of my rule, which is viewer retention is everything. And I call these guys. I got two right here to pick from. I'll take this one. Um. (laughs) <laughs> They're my little uh, viewer retention machines. Yeah. I'll let you just sort of talk over it um, because really what what becomes obvious through this is you have co-stars. Yes. Yes. And um, I know I look like a real uh, cat lady right now. I've got four cats in my house right now, um, but they are fosters. And I was just going to say fosters. you're fostering them, right? <laughs> yes. Well, he um, he's actually featured in the video we're watching now. So he he did stick around. He won me over. But um, this guy's going to her permanent home um, pretty soon here. So thank you. Thank you for, for doing that. Yes. No problem. It's great because you get uh, what I call perma kittens because the moment they're not kittens anymore, they're out of my house. So uh, <laughs> they're so good for these videos. And the, the great thing is it's a symbiotic relationship. I if, so, if anyone comments asking me, oh, my gosh, like, where the heck can I get that kitten? I'm like, here's the link. <laughs> And it has it has made it so that a lot of the kids that I've adopted out, some of their adopters found them through a politics video on TikTok. And um, that has been really successful because there are so many kittens in Austin, Texas. You're, you're getting me on my animal services soapbox, which you don't want to do. Um, but but I think what I think your point, though, Jenna, is is this is that it it humanizes the experience. Yeah. Yeah. There's, um, there's so many ways to accomplish that too. Uh, I tend to try to go for a more professional, um, brand, but I've seen people do, um, there's another example. There's a woman whose account I can't remember if I can, I'll send it to you. But, um, she starts every single video. She puts her phone down and she starts putting on lip gloss. And what it does is it makes the video feel like you're on FaceTime with a friend. Right. Um, and it is just, I, I had always really enjoyed her videos and I'd never really processed that she did the exact same thing at the beginning of each of them. But it really makes them, like you said, it humanizes the person talking. And when you're talking about something as uh, wonky as a highway expansion or um, I've done videos about uh, elder care and... Uh, about, you know, the city of Austin in-depth budgeting processes, you know, you need a human element and just being a human talking about it is not enough, not with the attention spans the way they are right now. Yeah. So, um, the kittens help. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, for, for you, Kelsey, with your kind of really leaning into the challenges that are out there, you're sort of humanizing it in the, in the realm that you're, you're like, bringing us along with your walk and taking us along with, uh, taking your cat, uh, on a ride, you're, you're, you know, uh, taking us to the grocery store. Uh, but I do want to, I, I do want to play this video here, um, that you sent over today. Um, I haven't watched this, so hopefully you're not cursing the, the entire time. Hopefully I'm not. If you care about stopping the I-35 expansion in Austin, which is set to begin next year, then listen up because I have yet another action for you to do. And yes, this is a text dot rendering of Riverside and I-35. A Rethink 35 volunteer photoshopped cars for how many lanes there will actually be. On Monday, TextDot published their final environmental impact statement, which is something that we were expecting. In response, Austin area Texas legislators released statements. Most of them praised TextDot for 
altering the plans to make them slightly better, the only one that actually opposed the plans was Gina Hinojosa. If more of our Texas reps speak out against the plan, it could pressure the federal government to step in and stop this project. Go to Rethink35.com and click the red banner at the top to write a letter. Please, please, please just take five minutes to do this. So when you put a, a, a plea, you know, an action item like that out, uh, Kelsey, uh, I know you're putting it out on TikTok, but then you're cross-posting it to um, other platforms, including, uh, again, Twitter slash X. Twitter. Twix, <laughs> Twixter. I've been calling it Twixter lately. <laughs> That's not bad. That's not bad. <laughs> I like that. Uh, what's, what's that response been like? I mean, is it crickets? Are you, are you, are you, um, do you immediately see a little bit of an uptick in, in people, you know, doing the call to action? Um, absolutely. And I can usually watch the amount of letters that come through after I post something like that. Um, so yeah, it's been really successful. The only drawback is TikTok releases special features to you as you grow your audience. So one of those features is link in bio. Um, and I don't have that feature because I still need 1,000 followers. So please follow me. Um, but that's why whenever oh, we have right a call to there. action, <laughs> when we have a call to action, I ask the people who do the website to put it on the banner so I can screenshot it and point to it. And that's been really helpful. Another thing about that TikTok video that not a lot of people know is that that led me to actually meeting my Texas rep in person. She invited me to the Capitol to talk about I-35, right. wow. which was incredible. So Gina Hinojosa invited me to talk and I told her about the history of our campaign and where we are now. And what happened is she ended up speaking out against the project after that meeting. Um, she spoke out against it at a town hall where she was the only rep on the stage to do so. And then she sent in a video for the rally, which she would have been there if it wasn't a special session. And then James Tallarico also um, supported us after that. That is awesome. Wow. Like I said, that algorithm will connect you. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Good stuff. What have we not talked about that uh, either of you would like to leave the audience with? I'd say the value of visuals. You know, you know this, you were, you were telling us about trying to keep things interesting, switching between formats, that kind of thing. And I've noticed the, when you're talking about, like I said, wonky budget policy, the, the value of having something for people to look at. Like I said, talking about it's the same reason that you want to have something interesting or confusing in the first three seconds because people need something to grab onto. And I think I shared a video about um, Prop A from back when I was a canvasser that had some of the, the kind of on-screen demo that I'm talking about. Right. Ever heard the phrase, numbers don't lie? Unfortunately, that's not true. It's really easy to lie with numbers, even if the numbers you're using are real. Let me give you an example. So in my city, a right-wing group is trying to divert a bunch of funds to the police from other social services. Their justification is, guys, it's only 1.2% of the entire city budget, and the police are currently understaffed. They need it. And yeah, all of those numbers are technically real, but they don't tell the truth. They got that number, 1.2%, by dividing the lowest possible cost estimate of this measure, $58 million, by the city of Austin's overall budget, $4.5 billion. But it's super misleading. If you take a much more accurate estimate, $120 million, and divide it by the portion of Austin's budget that can actually be moved around, $1.2 billion, you get 10%. Both sets of numbers are real. Only one of them tells the truth. This measure wants to cut 10% of city service money and give it to the police. Boom. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and um, that video, I think, was was very successful. And it it was because I gave some piece like imagine that video without something on screen to look at. It's me talking about percentages and 48 million versus 120 million. And it's not interesting, like genuinely. And so the addition of just something on screen for people to grab onto is makes a huge difference. And that is what makes TikTok so useful. It's it's the whole 
point of TikTok is that you are constantly evaluating um, the time that you're spending on each post. That's not how Instagram works. That's not how Twitter works. When you're on TikTok, you're, the person scrolling is actively making a value judgment about what they're watching. And um, I think that is why quality, or at least, I, I, I won't say quality, because I'm there are people with much better TikToks out there than me that do that don't necessarily do as well. But engaging content is makes a huge difference in how well your content performs. And I don't think that there's too many other um, I think that it's much more of an effect on TikTok or really any video platform than most other types of content. Yeah. So Kelsey, really most of your content that you're producing and putting out there, you're trying to get action. You're trying to get engagement. You're trying to, to move the needle. And in, in some ways you don't, you don't want just a thumbs up. You don't want a lot, you know, it, you know, you, you, it's like, yeah, I, I want eyeballs, but really you want somebody to, to sign the petition. You want somebody to show up to an actual rally. And, and so close us out here by talking about, you know, leveraging that philosophy of, of the content that you're creating and the other members of the team, because really for you and for this movement, you're, you're really wanting action. You really want people to get engaged uh, and, and actually show up in IRL, you know, <laughs> in real life out on, you know, at a rally. Yeah, um, while I was planning the rally, I got advice from another Rethink 35 volunteer who's ran rallies for hundreds of thousands of people. And the main thing he told me was people will show up if number one, they believe it's important for them to show up. And number two, they know someone else who is going to show up who they can meet there. And so I was always keeping those things in mind as I was creating content. And for me, I think the relationship building and letting people know that I want them to be there, I'm expecting to be there, has been huge for me. So I've made relationships with people on TikTok and I met them for the first time at the rally. And I was DMing them, you know, a week, days before, hey, are you gonna be there? I can't wait to meet you. Same on Twitter. I met so many Twitter friends for the first time at the rally. And it's because I really made an effort to form that relationship with them and reach out to them and let them know I really care about them being there. It's not easy. <laughs> it's just really impressive. Yeah, I mean, it's it, it's it's way easier, especially when you have an algorithm working for you to, to do a little bit of the work of, of getting the, the content in front of the eyeballs that, uh, you know, are gonna, will resonate with those eyeballs. It's a whole nother thing to get them to the next level, to actually click through and sign a petition, to actually show up in person at a rally. Uh, kudos, once again. Thank you. That fabulous event. And thank you both so very much for joining me on the Active Towns podcast. It's been an absolute joy and pleasure. Thank you, John. It's been really fun. Hey, thank you so much for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed this episode. And if you did, please give it a thumbs up, <laughs> leave a comment down below and share it with a friend. And if you haven't done so already, I'd be honored to have you subscribe to the channel. Just click on the subscription button down below and ring that notifications bell. And if you're enjoying this content that I'm creating, please consider joining my team of Active Towns Ambassadors out on Patreon. Uh, patrons do get early and ad-free access to all this content. Uh, and it's very much appreciated. Uh, well, until next time, this is John signing off by wishing you much activity, health, and happiness. Cheers. And again, sending a huge thank you out to all my Active Towns ambassadors supporting the channel on Patreon, Buy Me A Coffee, YouTube Super Thanks, as well as making contributions to the nonprofit and purchasing things from the Active Towns store. Every little bit adds up and it's much appreciated. Thank you all so much.